welcome, welcome. This is, uh, as Sarah said, the uh, session on building and scaling successful teams. I'm Roland Stallworth III. I'll be your host and moderator uh, this afternoon. And you know, I'm, I'm pretty fired up for this phenomenal you know, group of panelists we have uh, today. But before we kind of dive into quick intros and, and, and the questions and discussion at hand, wanted to actually get a, a quick feel for, for everyone in the room. I assume most folks are, are, are founders and are you know, building their companies. But you know, for us in this conversation, our goal is to you know, provide guidance and tactics and insights to how you know, to effectively manage your company as it, as it evolves. Right? And so for, in order for us to do that most impactfully, to get a sense of, of, of what stage you guys are at with, with your guys' uh, your guys's companies and ideas, right? So show of hands, the number of founders in the room. Wow. Okay, there it is, there it is. And then keep wow. your hands raised if, if, you, if you're past the kind of idea generation phase, right? You're, okay, keep your hands raised if you if you're, you know, have five to 10 to 20 employees, you have product in market, you guys are going, you've proven it out, you're building, and now you're at growth stage, you're, you're ready to scale. You have 50, 100, hundreds of employees. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So that's, okay, no, so, no, this is good, right? This is great. This, this is part of, part of the conversation, part of the goal here is to, once again, share insights, share experiences from our phenomenal panelists uh, here today. Is that, does that sound good? Perfect, perfect, perfect. So brief introductions, brief, brief background. I'll actually start with myself. Like I said, Rollins Talwar the third. I'm an early stage investor uh, with a firm called Nava Ventures, a Series A focus fund, $175 million under management. And my journey in terms of all things tech, entrepreneurship, innovation actually started here on campus uh, back in 2011. I got my undergrad in management science and engineering, got my master's in communication. I went, had a cup of coffee up in the Canadian Football League for a little bit after school. I, I played football and ran track during my time here at Stanford as well. Short stint in, in commercial real estate, uh, working with tech companies, and now an investor. And quick common thread in, in terms of my journey has been around teamwork and collaboration and team building. So the topic at hand is, is near and dear to my heart. And so we also have the amazing Ritu uh, Narayan here, who's the CEO and founder of, of Zoom. She also hails from the Stanford family. Uh, she got an engineering degree, master's degree uh, in, in, in Stanford School of Business. And Zoom is an incredible company that, that you can think of as a reimagined way for, for student transportation, right? And, and it was actually inspired by her journey as a working mother trying to balance between her career and, and, and her family. Uh, she's had a phenomenal background as former executive at, at Yahoo, Oracle, and eBay, and will you know, be able to share a bunch of incredible insights for her journey uh, as an entrepreneur and as an uh, individual in the tech ecosystem for a long time. So let's, let's show some love. Let's show some Thank love. Come on. <laughs> there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Next, we have uh, Dr. Michelle Longmire, who is a Stanford-trained you know, physician and entrepreneur uh, who's you know, driven by increasing you know, human health via the power of, of technology. Uh, she founded her company, Medible, back in 2015 to you know, enable uh, therapies to be better received from patients at a, at a faster pace through advancing clinical trials uh, through digital technologies. And she, you know, she's incredible. You'll, you'll hear her journey, but, but her journey and her story, I think, is one that will be very applicable to all of us here in the room in terms of our companies and growing and scaling as it pertains to managing our teams. And last but not least, we have Melissa Gill. Uh, and a Colombian American entrepreneur and, and advocate uh, for social justice. Um, Melissa is uh, very in, involved with and in starting a bunch of ventures that directly empower underestimated communities. Uh, she's uh, very passionate about uh, sustainable uh, uh, in, environmental uh, strategies and, and, and eco-friendly processes. But more importantly, she's the, the executive vice president of Costex, Tract uh, Costex Tractor Parts and is on the board of several nonprofits. Um, so she is an incredible leader, not only within kind of her entrepreneurial journey, but also within the community as well. And so as, as you can see, we have a phenomenal, phenomenal group of people, phenomenal uh, panel here with us today that we'll, we'll dive into discussion around building successful teams. But let's give them, let's give them all a round of applause and, and some love as we get started. Perfect, so to, to start off the conversation, 
you know, we're going to actually dive into each one of their personal journeys, right? Because as the founders in the room know, you know, as you build a company, as you continue to scale, your roles and responsibilities kind of change and evolve throughout, right? And so we want to actually start from the beginning, right? And we mm -hmm. actually, Ritu, we start with you and think about, you know, the inspiration behind Zoom and, and, and kind of where it started, why it started, and, and where you are today. Kind of walk us, walk us through that. So inspiration for Zoom actually was from a very personal need of mine. Um, I was working at eBay and my younger one transitioned to school and always when the pickup of drop-offs they'd fall apart, it was like, oh, you can't work anymore. This is it. And there was a curiosity behind like, why has technology not changed? Here I am working at eBay with 5 million sellers, 300 million customers all across the world who are connecting to each other. But in my personal life, I'm as if in the dark ages, nothing has changed. And my mom, who was an educator in India, left the job for exact same reason that I was worried about. And it became such a big curiosity that I left my job and I came to Stanford. And first day when I came in, I, my goal was just to explore this idea and refine this idea uh, over. So in the beginning, it was Uber for kids. People used to call it that way about the thing. and. Uh, I was the first driver, my kids were the first rider, it all started that way. And over the period of the time, we scaled significantly. And in the early days, we discovered school as a go-to market. School started asking, this is such an amazing platform. We have never had anything like that. Can we use it for our own needs? And that led us to insight, wow, school transportation is broken. 27 million kids travel twice daily and uh, it's the largest mass transit system in the US, but in 80 years, nothing has changed. No technology. If you still go in schools, people have uh, walkie-talkies and notepad, and they're running around. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on. And uh, end, end result of that is uh, things are not used efficiently. The budgets are spent, but it's very expensive for schools. Students spend enormous time commuting because things are not optimized. So we do, we take the entire service stack and we started doing this. And today, just in journey, I, I want to describe to you from that ride of serving end children and parent, we serve very large districts and we take big contracts with them and transform their entire transportation system. Our goal is every district in the country can use it. Wow. Incredible, incredible. And she's being in, in, you know, incredibly humble right now as well. What, what was the latest valuation on the, on the recent round of funding? And, and who is your investors? So yeah, we have some pretty incredible investors. Uh, Sequoia Capital was a Series A. We have uh, BMW, SoftBank, and our valuation is just a little under a billion dollar, 937 we'll million. We'll give her the unicorn. We'll give her the unicorn status. We'll give her, we'll, we'll give her the extra 50 mil. We'll give yeah. her the unicorn. So, so actually, I want to I want to double click on, you know, you go from the the Uber for kids now to you know a, essentially a unicorn that's focused more on the on the school systems, right? And so, you as the leader, how has your journey and responsibilities kind of changed throughout throughout that you know throughout that scale and throughout that growth? Yeah, as a founder, you're very hands on. Uh, I also have two co-founders with me. Pretty much, all three of us did three or four roles at a given time. Like I was always doing finance, marketing, and the, my own CEO role, my co-founder was doing operations and sales and other roles. So all of us like were doing three other roles while being expert in one single thing we were. And over the time you find very good people from outside, hire them, train them, and you have to delegate. And you, initially it may feel like very overbearing even to people who join from outside, if you don't delegate it the right way, that, oh, the founder knows too much. Uh, would we ever know that much enough to be able to do that role? So art of scaling is finding great people and be able to train them in the right way. And our journey for hiring also changed. Initially, when we used to hire, it was very much for consumer. Then we were in transition phase, and we would look for people who were both consumer and enterprise. So we went into very challenging phase where we wouldn't be able to find right talent. It was very tough for us to hire. And when we got this clarity that B2B or an enterprise is the right go-to market for us, everything aligned for us mm -hmm. in terms of hiring. And today we have some of the best talent in the Valley wow. working for us. 
Incredible, incredible. I appreciate you sharing the journey and congrats on the, all the success Thank today. You. We'll we'll transition over uh, to, to to doctor on the on the uh, on the stage. Um, talk to us about Medible, right? And, and the journey, the the inspiration behind it, and, and similarly your path to to the scale and growth that you see seen today. Sure. So. Um, so, so thank you so much. I love Rollins Energy. I was a resident here at Stanford, and I was in dermatology and on a track as a physician scientist where you spend most of your time in a lab and then half a day a week in clinic. And I was researching a rare disease called systemic sclerosis that had a 90% fatality rate prior to the discovery that, of all things, Viagra would treat the lung disease of women, largely, who had systemic sclerosis. And the repurposing of this drug you know, transformed the lives of patients. And the group that I was at here was basically a referral center for almost anyone in the world who needed to have a cutting edge therapy. So we were researching the disease from every angle. But the reality was that so many people could not come to participate in the research because you know, here we are in Palo Alto, and people are affected all over the world with this disease. So, you know, I'm running across campus, and there's a contest, and I grab this little thing, and I'm like, okay, I should enter this contest. And I ended up, I think, winning like $10,000 with this idea that we should create a technology bridge to research into clinical care. Um, and, you know, it sparked this idea that, you know, there's not just a lab, there's not just an ivory tower to invent things that will absolutely transform human lives. So I incorporated, I found a lawyer, I found you know, random people in Silicon Valley that helped me found a company um, in the early days and hired our first engineers. And it's pretty wild when you look at you know, where it is today as a platform that has now um, been a part of over 300 clinical trials globally. We work with the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Um, we were part of the COVID vaccines, are part of the COVID therapies. We've been a part of breakthrough approvals for breast cancer. And our whole strategy is let's remove geography as the barrier to participating in clinical research. And through that, we've actually shown that we're able to accelerate the clinical trial process, which gets these drugs to market faster. Um, and yeah, I've done it through an incredible team. I've got one of our incredible product managers, Shuba, here with me today. But yeah, it comes down to the vision, I think, a disruptive idea, a hard problem to solve and ultimately an awesome team to make it happen. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. And, and, and I, I want to highlight, you mentioned kind of the, the team formation at the beginning to actually found the company and kind of get the ball rolling. How do you, how do you equate that process to the, to the process of building a team throughout on kind of later stages as you've been in you know, these, these trials and, and, and with these pharmaceutical companies, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think that like the biggest takeaway in the beginning is just never get discouraged. I remember, you know, I was pitching A16Z and the guy was like, you're wasting your time, you're never gonna get a pharmaceutical customer. You know, maybe at that time the company was five people, now we're 550 people globally. But I think that yeah. it, it comes down to, you know, and we now have the biggest pharmaceutical companies as customers. In those early days, you know, it's just the sheer determination of the founder and the founding team but then you build a team of people who have equal conviction. You know, they feel the energy, they feel that this has to happen, this reality must exist. Um, and I think, you know, that's what you need all the way. And interestingly, I don't think it ever changes in the spirit of the person you need. Mm. Like, you know, one of the things I love, again, about working with Shuba, you know, she comes from a background of Twilio and these bigger enterprise software companies. But every day, you know, we're working together, almost in some senses, still at the ground floor of what needs to be true today to achieve the scale that we want. So I think I made a mistake along the way to think the persona of the person we needed should be different. And actually, the better you can serve the true spirit of the founding energy and the people who are really willing to roll up their sleeves, I don't know that it, I haven't seen what we need in a person change over time. Great insight. No, it makes sense. Melissa, you know, kind of rounding out the conversation around the personal, you know, personal journey and your personal journey, would love for you to actually kind of give give the audience, you know, from start to finish, where you know where you've come from, what what drives you from a, a kind of social impact perspective, from a professional sense, you know, the family business that you have rocking and rolling. Talk talk to us a little bit about your journey. So, oh, 
14. <laughs> so first of all, I'm very, um, I'm so thankful to be here in a room with so many inspiring entrepreneurs. I mean, the energy here is just amazing. So thank you for this opportunity, Stanford. Um, second of all, I mean, I was born into this business. I found, I, I watched my parents who founded the business since a very young age, sacrifice everything, um, work the weekends and, and do everything possible and never give up on their dreams, on their vision. Um, so that's what inspires me today to keep their legacy going. I'm going in, we're going into the second generation and we, what we do is we sell tractor parts for the construction, marine, um, mining divisions and we have over 70,000 different parts selling over to over 150 countries. And we rely on a strong network of dealers, of team members, over 550 um, team members up to date. And we came out of a certain, we, our vision is to provide a better alternative to the mechanic, to the end user that's using our product. Because what we do is offer a uh, great quality product at a price a lot uh, more competitive than what they would get if they would go to the original equipment manufacturer. So it's basically generic, but for heavy equipment machinery. And we created a brand out of it because we started to manufacture. So once you start to manufacture, everything starts rolling. And it's called the CTP, the CTP brand. So we're very proud of our brand and the whole premise is we always want to give more than what the customer expects. So the packaging is, is amazing. Um, you'll, you'll always find something extra in the box next to the part that will always give the customer feeling like they walked away from a great deal. And that's what we started. My background is marketing. I've always wanted to, you know, for me, the marketing realm is amazing, the ability to inspire and through creative design and to really um, push a brand to a phenomenal level to create that goodwill is, is just amazing to me. So I started off in marketing and then eventually I realized, well, this whole, this marketing premise I can apply to, to logistics, to distribution, to manufacturing, to HR, I mean, you cannot be speaking about a great product and then not have the whole, the whole, all the departments working in line. So naturally I became, okay, if I want to do something even, I want to scale this business, I have to go beyond just marketing and go into every single department. And that's where I am today. I'm leading an amazing group um, of managers that we constantly in, um, inspire and we want to grow to the next level. So. Incredible. And I don't know about you guys, but I think like a common thread between you know all three is that your guys' passion around what you guys are doing and, and how you guys are doing it, right? And I think from from a leadership standpoint or, or a team building standpoint, you know, having that superpower I think is is essential. But you know, Doctor, you you talked about it in terms of trying to find that that purpose and passion within the team that you're you're hiring and building as well. I guess as, as you guys have, you know, remind me how many folks are at, at Zoom now? A total 900. 900. So we got 900, 500 and change, 500 and change, right? As you guys have expanded your teams to the size that they're at, how have you guys tried to maintain that level of passion and that, that, that level of, of quality and, and kind of alignment of values as you guys have grown? Maybe, Melissa, we'll start, we'll start with you. So basically we firmly believe that in inclusion right if if even like everybody in your team is important every single position is important i'm talking about everyone so we invite everybody to be part of a continuous improvement program that anybody could submit their idea about any changes or any efficiency that they suggest because they're the ones who are on hand right they're the ones doing the job so who best to get this information from with them. So programs like this inspire everybody to to be a part of something bigger than themselves, to feel like they're included and to be able to incentivize them along the way. It's it's amazing. You you can get the best ideas from unexpected places and that's these programs are what what we find is is it's why we continue growing, right? So anytime that we can we, anytime we have a program, we have CTP University, which is, uh, we even brought English classes in-house. 
so anybody can learn English if they want to. Uh, to be so, it's again the whole premise is everyone is included, everyone is important, every job. If for us, if you're part of our team, you're going to feel included. So. Sure. So you know, I think for us, you can imagine what the problem we're trying to solve is foundationally a medical problem. So patients are at the center of what we do. They're the end users of our software. And what we need is a combination of life science and clinical development, like DNA, and tech DNA. So those are kind of the inputs that we're looking for in either both categories, but certainly one or the other. I think in an individual, what we want and what we're always striving for is somebody who's deeply passionate about our mission to enable effective therapies to reach patients faster. I think the biggest differentiation of our company is our team's passion for solving this problem and you know, bringing their expertise to that equation. I think you know, what's really important in building a team is that you really check your ego at the door. And that people put the team in front of their individual kind of pursuits, because it's really about the team outcome. So our motto is be the best teammate and fiercest opponent. And I think if you look across Medible, where we, the best, you know, the, the, what, what makes the best team member is really that low ego, high output, passion for the mission, and going the extra mile for the team, because that's ultimately how you're gonna accomplish your goals. I'll add to, so both the points are really great, like taking feedback and uh, people who are performing and yet have the teamwork. I want to give a little different perspective. It's super useful for founders to, in the beginning, write down your mission statement super clearly, write down your values, your principles. I cannot even tell you how amazing work it does to align people around. So for mm -hmm. us also, people are at different levels, right? Like you have the C-suite, and then you have the drivers who are your brand ambassadors, who are the first ones who are actually transporting children, and then they are super critical to the operations of the company. How do you align different sets of people? And it is by mission. Like, if you ask mm -hmm. across the board, why did people join the company, they will say mission. Somehow or other, they connected with it. Uh, and in the beginning, I thought maybe only parents would be interested in, the, in this kind of thing, millennial uh, or people who are just fresh out of the college, why would they be interested? Surprisingly, within a minute, they were selling my mission back to me. When my mom was working, I was here 30 miles away and I was the last one to be picked up. I don't want other kids to face this problem. So some way or the other, if you have that mission very clearly aligned, you'll be surprised how people get completely aligned. And second thing is you'll be repeating it a lot till your ears start ringing. <laughs> Even till today, like four times a day, I repeat my mission and values and things to people as part of the conversation. And, you, and that narrative can pivot. So for example, when company pivoted from B2C to B2B, one of the biggest thing for me was uh, growing my founding story because my founding story a little bit changed. I founded it out of my personal experience and I had to just make it applicable to the bigger thing that we were doing, even though it was still the same, like we wanted the best for the child and best for the transportation of the child. We did the work again, like same narrative, but made it expanded so that everybody can talk about it in the company and be associated with it. So I would say that's the biggest thing. Values very clearly defined, mission very clearly defined. One more thing I'll add. At some point, we had four core values, and it seemed like it was still not clear to people what makes you successful in the company, what defines you. So three years back, we actually broke down our four values into 12 principles. So exactly people knew what they were getting into, what was the behaviors that were great, what were the behaviors that were not great. And surprisingly, if you give that structure, everybody is able to then know. Like, it's not hidden. It's there, out there, and people can follow it. and then you can scale the team mm. to uh, deliver on your promise of what you want to do. Oh, makes, makes total sense. I know, you know, having kind of clear goalposts, having clear, you know, missions and values illustrated is, is, is core and, and something that we actually, you know, used to do at the, you know, on the Stanford football side of yeah. things. We'd have, you know, kind of a team covenant and we'd yeah. all go and sign it and like the whole shebang. But um, I actually wanted to, wanted to double click on this notion of, of mission and values as it relates to you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? I think, you know, core, a core mantra of the, of, the, of the conference around building momentum is centered around 
you know, do one thing, right? Like making, making progress, you know, over, over perfection in terms of diversity, inclusivity, you know, unless you gave a kind of great, uh, you know, kind of tip or trick in terms of how you guys kind of do it internally to kind of get all ideas to the table. But for you guys, as you guys have scaled and, and kind of painted out your missions over time and evolved over time, how have you kept kind of diversity at the, at the forefront of, of, of your team building? And this could be, we could go popcorn yeah. style. We don't, we don't got to keep going back and forth. Right. Whatever's clever, whoever feels strongest. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so, ba like, whoever we hire, we don't look basically like where they come from, who they, what they look like, what, that's not important. It's whether you have the values. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, it, surprisingly enough, over 40 years passed by and we didn't have clearly our vision, our mission, and our values clearly written, clearly outlined our, our why as to what we're in business. And because I took the LBEN course, I'm very grateful to that, very grateful. They, that was the first class that, that was, we took, right? It was about, you need to know your why, because that's how you attract the people that are for your business. And it's just easier that way when people are, they're clearly going the same wavelength as you and going the same vision and believe in the founder, believe in what you're trying to do. And that is, uh, that's thankfully to Elvan, we, we put it all over our employee handbook, it's all over the walls, and it's part of our everyday conversations. So again, like it's not important where you come from when you apply to work with us. It's, it's do you have the values? Are you a good person? <laughs> do you collaborate? Are you teamwork? Like you mentioned, put your ego at the door. Like, there's many cases that people lose everything over pride, over ego. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. And it's so unfortunate because these are talented people with so much to offer, mm -hmm. but they get their emotions in the way. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because in, in our company, I, my main, my main uh, purpose is I don't allow any disrespect for anyone. Like, we set the bar in how we treat people, how you want to be treated. So that's very important for for our employees to feel valued and contribute their maximum to, to the company and to the goals and objectives and also growing themselves as well. So it doesn't matter where you're from, basically. Mm -hmm. so. I love that. Anything you guys would add? Or? Yeah, so uh, for us, all three co-founders are immigrants. My other co-founders are male, so I was the only female there. And I always was in minority. As a tech woman in uh, like undergrad in computer science, there was six female out of 300 students. When I worked in tech, uh, I just assumed that's the way things are. And until I came to eBay, where 42% of their working population, especially executives, were women. And it made such a big impact on my thinking about how to solve problems, because internally they would say like 50% of the population of the world is women. Why wouldn't the decisions or design of the products be the same way? And actually that became inspiration to handle my own problem and uh, build solutions out of it. So that was always the inclusion was always a part of it. At some, what helps is like during the interview process, if people see diversity, if people see themselves and the team, it gets easier to attract diverse populations. So there were chances, there were occasions when people came into the office and they say, "Wow, this looks like United Nations, <laughs> like people from all over the country, all over the world, and thing uh, there." But one challenge I had was in leadership. There was still largely like very few female, uh, till very late in the thing. And I couldn't understand why it was the case because we were trying very hard. We would tell the recruiters we want to see. And at some point that chain, now 50% of my leadership is uh, diverse and women. And uh, part of the thing was making it mainstream for me, not making it a big deal, but just having a normal recruitment process. And at some point you hire the one and people see, oh, there, there, is a, there are two female leaders. And then you hire another and it became a, uh, like a center for attraction. So it, it's a process that once you are too late in the process, it's very hard to do because mm -hmm. then people think, oh, I'll be the only one odd person out. But if you start early in the process, then it accelerates for you and it just builds on your own. You don't even have to do anything special because diversity attracts diversity. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's one, of course, you want the very, very best people. And if you approach that and you find those great people, um, I think 
in a world where diversity adds to greatness, which is absolutely true. These are critical perspectives and different experiences and that have to exist within a solution set. I think then, you know, you actually build diversity quite naturally. Now, I do think that when you start to say interview for a head of sales, it's just crazy to me how like you get like one in 20 are female candidates or like yeah. the profile starts to look really similar in a certain category. But you know, I think one of the ideas I've had recently is when you've got great people who aren't in those positions yet, um, and you're not seeing them in the candidate pool, that's where you should do internal promotion, really try to focus on it, because if your mix is different and you can build that next category of leaders to look different, you're actually changing the dynamic at the top when you can't necessarily look for someone to come in the door at that level because the world hasn't afforded that opportunity, which is you know, obviously not only unjust, it's a completely unharnessed opportunity for magnificent change. Oh, that, I, I, there's a lot to take away there, and a couple, well, a couple knee-jerk reactions for me, it's like, it seems like, especially for, for folks in the room that haven't reached that next inflection point of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of folks in their, in their company, that you guys have, you guys are in the perfect time to start building a diver, diverse mm -hmm. team, a diverse leadership team, hiring within, kind of promoting within, you know, what would you guys say in terms of, you know, actually the key roles, right, you talk about head of sales, you talk about leadership roles, for you guys along your journey have been like incredible uh, kind of moments in time for the growth in terms of the team building, right? Who, who were those folks? Why were those roles so important? What, what, what the timing, what unlock did it provide you and how did you guys kind of go and actually conquer that, that feat ahead of you? So my biggest passion is being able to see someone that didn't believe in themselves become somebody amazing. Like that's, I even get emotional speaking about it because I've seen it so many times in our company. Somebody will sit there and tell them, you know what, I'm not ready for this. And I tell them, and I look them in the eyes, yes, you are. You have what it takes. We'll get you there. But I know you have what it takes. And then when I see them grow and prosper in the organization, that is everything to me. That is like, wow, we're, what we're doing here, we're changing lives. So, uh, to, I mean, that's why we do what we do, right? Because there's so many, like you mentioned, there's so many people, like when, even when you put that jo the job out, you don't get the females, you don't, as a majority, you don't get that diverse pool of candidates that you want to get. So what you have to do is look internally at your team members and inspire them to reach that level because they already know the company culture, which is the most difficult to get in many organizations. Not everybody fits in, and that's okay, right? Because your company is not gonna be for everyone, and you have to be very clear about that. This is our vision, this is our mission. It's okay if this is not for you, right? As soon as you're clear about that, the people that are for you, that are working hard and have been for years in your organization, lift them up and tell them, yes, you can do it. Yes, this is for you. So that for me is, why do what we do, right? I would add to, actually, to answer your question and add to what you said about internally promoting. Head of sales, and I 100% agree, if I were to advertise today, most of the candidates would be men. We did have a head of sales in our previous version, uh, which was the same way. They came from Google, and all you could imagine in terms of characteristics for head of sales. And then three years back, we hired a VP of partnerships. And uh, they work very closely with my co-founder and CEO, and they win all the success in the past three years in terms of growing the contracts came from them. And today she's the head of sales. We were looking for going out, and then suddenly my, my we both my co-founder and I are discussing, and she they were like we are not looking enough. It's right there for us. So uh, that is some, sometimes when you're not finding diversity, I completely agree with you, like growing leaders at a different level and then promoting them mm -hmm. from within can become an amazing source. So, uh, yeah. I think one of the challenges there is actually the imposter syndrome. So, you know, like we've raised a bunch of money, we've got, you know, Blackstone and Tiger and all these people who are looking at you, someone they've never seen do this before, and like, you know, you always feel like, wow, like, can I really do this? They can, do they think I can do this? The fascinating thing is I actually think they do think that I can do it. <laughs> I probably question it more than they do. But I think what I've realized is there was a period of time where 
I almost felt compelled because of the imposter syndrome to hire the person I thought that they thought should do the job. That is so true. And I think that's where you get super burned. Like, don't hire that person. In fact, understand that you can only play the game that you're good at. You can only win in the game that you've designed and you've created all of the rules. And you know that's what being a founder is really about. And so I just say like lean into what you think is right. It's the only way you're going to win anyway. And like understand where the imposter syndrome is telling you to do, instructing you in a way that you don't think necessarily aligns with what you want versus what you think the board wants. I think that's like I've made some of the worst hires, kind of thinking that I needed to do what they thought was the right thing to do. I 100% agree with that. I've done myself <laughs> where a board is there with few hours with you. They right. are not the ones in the trenches doing things day in and day out. They are not dealing with people in the hard situations, hard conversations. But somehow you're right, being a female founder and female CEO of where they have these amazing successes like Airbnb and Google and others, and you're like suddenly comparing yourself to those CEOs and thinking, what would they think if I don't do this certain way? What would they think if I don't get the talent certain way? But it is fundamentally about your company and your mission and who you are as a soul of the company. And once you understand that there's no going back, and I'm thinking now that you mentioned that that might be the sense of getting successful in diversity also mm. for us, mm. like getting over that and just hiring for <coughs> what the company needs truly. Well, let's, let's, uh, we have, you know, we're about time for one more question before we open up to q and I actually want to continue on this talk track around team building, not just from, you know, we've been talking about internally ourselves as leaders, building our team, but uh, on the other side of the table, you have investors, you have other stakeholders, you have board members, right, who are part of the team and mission as well, right? And so, you know, I remember talking to founders before this session last night as well that talk about, you know, managing all the different responsibilities, managing all the different incentives that are at play, all the investors, right, as you take on more and more funding, as you, you know, grow, you know, and, and scale. How have you guys, what, what would be one thing you kind of leave, leave a founder here today with in terms of how to best manage that side of the, of the kind of the team world? I mean, number one is don't do a shitty deal, period. <laughs> I have seen great companies and great CEOs been taken down by really crappy board members. And like, no matter how appealing it is, they never agree to a certain set of things, never agree to the wrong veto, to veto rights, never agree to ratchets, never agree to differences in, you know, on liquidity, aside from preferred versus common, but with any multipliers, don't agree to anything it is not going to serve you and the people behind you in building the company with the understanding that you know what the future has to be much better than anyone on the board. I think that's really, really, really critical because it's just so sad. Like I look at some of our competitors, and in fact, one of our biggest competitive advantages was that we had an awesome board because they were some of these companies were destroyed by investors that didn't understand how to ultimately win. So I think I think that would be number one. I don't know. Have you guys seen this? Like, yeah. So we've never worked with investors. We've been, uh, you know, we've we have a strong partner ever since I don't know 30 years that walked one day into the business and said, "I'm here to lend you money." And my father was like, "I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't want it." He's like, "No, no, no. Here you go. Here you go." He kept insisting, and up to now, he's still our lender. No matter how many different banks he goes through, we're still going with the same. And he's the reason that we're here today. Also, he, it's Bank of America has sponsored us as a company to be in L band. So I think relationships, like you mentioned, is so key. Like, and listen to your intuition and and always like follow relationships, right? Follow the ones who have been there for you um, since the beginning that followed your vision, that trusted you. So don't let that uh, come into. Like that's everything in a business. It's relationships. It's people that you deal with, and just stick to that, and you'll be very successful. So. I uh, yeah, no, I agree. Building relationships and having great terms, great board, could make a whole difference uh, to you. But in the end, you're the soul of the company. If you're yeah. a founder, <laughs> just remember that everybody else will come and go. Their attention will change. Tomorrow, something else will be shiny object but you're the soul of the company and that's what, never forget that. 
Yeah. Wow, wow. Wise words, that. wise words. Let's, let's, give, let's give a round of applause. We have, we have a few minutes for, for Q&A, so, oh yeah, let's get the questions going. Man. It, was, it, it was tight, it was neck and neck. I think it, it might have been best. Talk to me, talk to me. We got the mic coming behind you. Oh, hello. Uh, thanks for that. This is super helpful. Uh, my name is uh, Mubarak. I run a fintech company in Africa called Bezo Money. It's a new bank for the unbanked. Um, and so, uh, over the years, I've managed to um, kind of like um, poach people from big companies, banks, and consulting agencies, the big ones. Um, the issue that we've had is that it's been very hard to get them to reconcile with the whole startup culture that we have. So I'd like to know how you were able to kind of like manage that. When you brought them in, how did you get them to understand and get into that culture of like doing things fast, not being afraid to fail, and all these different things? And I've sent you um, uh, connections on LinkedIn. I hope you accept. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> so one thing, I, I've worked for large companies before starting my own uh, thing. And I'll tell you, even in large companies, there are people who are catalysts who work fast and they are always finding new things and they're frustrated by politics and they move on. They move on to either the next company or next venture. So one thing to find out is get that, what you were talking about, what's your soul? If it is working fast and doing things, you make that as a hiring criteria because they can bring the best of both. Mm -hmm. They can bring, changing people is very hard. Like if they if culturally or fundamentally they don't like to work fast, you will never change them. But somehow make that as a criteria in your hiring process, whether it is inexperienced hiring or project-based hiring, that can they move fast? Maybe their references when you're doing, you can find out through references with people who have worked with them in the past. Like how, what's the style of working? Mm -hmm. Perfect. I think you're next. Uh, up front. Oh, I'm sorry, I got, we got you, we got you, we'll get it going, we'll get it going. Mine, mine's really quick. Um, hi, I'm Annie Sloan. I am the co-founder and CEO of The Host Co. We're in the hospitality space. Um, in the early days of all of your companies, uh, what things did you employ to really create that, that gravitational force towards your company? Because in the early days, maybe some equity, right? Um, but... It, how did you compete and how did you create that to get those really high, high quality people when you didn't have recruiters and you didn't have a ton of money? Well, I saw it myself. It was work. Everyone's going to tell you, oh, if from one day to the next, how did you get so large? No, it was work. It was weekends. It was nights. I saw it, everything. I, I, I feel like internally I wanted to get into this business to hang out with my parents more, seriously, because I never saw them that much growing up because it was work, it was sacrifice. And so you need to be ready to do the work, right? And never give up, never, ever, ever give up. Cannot under, not say that enough. Yeah, and I think the mission, like it seems, it's the unifying force and I love, you know, it really is your expression of your soul on this journey and this solving this particular problem, I think that that's really powerful. Also, I would say, you know, really gut check what you think you need because, like, the person that you need might not be the person that everyone else is going after. Mm -hmm. And so I think, like, when I look back at who helped me build the company, you know, in those early days, they were people who were willing to work for very little money. They were, they would be like not necessarily the person that Google would be going after. And so I think that you've got to find the person who has the skills and the drive that you need to make it happen, that you actually like to spend time with. I think that's another critical factor. Uh, yes. And the other uh, thing is like you hire first, it's not like you need to hire 100 great people right. in one day. Over, or one week or one month. So it happens over a period of time. You hire first two, three people who are great. Those two, three people help you or hire the next 10 people who are great type of thing. So first few hires might be more critical, but I completely agree, it's the storytelling. You storytelling, and I used to constantly, even today I do that, I constantly watch where did people's eye blow up, where did I lose them? And I'm constantly refining my story through that. So you, as you're interviewing people, see what resonates with them, what, what doesn't resonate, and change fast. And the interesting thing is what will enable you to get great talent 
is also what will make you, I think, a great seller to customers. It's the same thing. It's the subconscious influence around what is it that matters and how do we help achieve that? You know, and how do you, as a talent, you know, or a person become a part of that? But it's interesting, the selling part of this job is not that different, whether it's investors, people you want to get on board, or your customers. I don't know if okay. anyone else feels that way. The art of persuasion. you got to yeah. persuade right. constantly. You can't just, you know, demand. you got to persuade, convince every single day. And the more you believe in it, it just becomes yeah. such a more powerful thing. Love it, love it. I will, maybe one or two more. Um, yeah, so I have a question. Um, so give you a little bit of background. Uh, I started an AI telehealth company inspired by my own stage four cancer, you know, aiming to support patients like me and also elderly like my mom. And we recently just got funded by NIH, which was like my first time hiring people. So what do you do when you have like several strong candidates? Um, and I read this book called Buy Back Your Time, and I like the suggestions like doing a test project, like, you know, give it to the most strong candidate and see which one kind of turn out the strong. So I'm, I'm kind of curious that, have you guys done those kind of things, like test project to decide which candidate to hire, if you have multiple strong candidates? Or um, have you tried other things in terms of your decision making process, like which one you eventually choose, like if you have multiple very strong candidates? Happens so many times. You're st you, there are two equally great candidates or three equally great candidates and you're trying to make a decision. One thing, uh, last year we hired a lot of new leadership. I was trying to complete my leadership team. Even before hiring, what really worked for us was, because bias comes in. <laughs> your bias of who you are liking, if you're trying to do this after, even before you're hiring, write down three mm -hmm. things that you would not yeah. fact, uh, negotiate on or sacrifice on. And during the interview process, your recruiter or people who are helping you, everybody knows those three things. When you are, and so many times it happens during the process, you forget about those three things and you continue. But then ultimately when you're making decisions, go back to those three things. Are they still relevant? And that will make your decision super objective in terms of do everybody meets those three criteria because then you can shortlist and really hone into who's the best person. Can we, we'll fast forward to one, one last question. Hey guys, uh, name's Ricky, I'm the co-founder of Route. So we are building tools for the cleaning industry. So I come from a family business. I built uh, my cleaning company. I have 24 family members in that business. Uh, the talent that we were hiring there to get to 400 employees is much different than now my tech startup. Uh, everybody was internally promoted. Everybody was, uh, promoted by instinct. You know, all the C-level execs were cleaning technicians. I didn't have to go outside of the company. I'm switched this to now. Uh, we're looking for a head of product. We're looking for a VP of growth. I'm looking for titles I've never had to hire for before. And me and my co-founder have never led a sales team. We never led certain, you know, like, and I struggle with if I don't know the KPIs or I don't know how to hold this person accountable, how do I know they're doing a great job? I mean, culture and values is one thing, uh, but getting the job done, uh, it's scary, because you know I've never held those roles accountable before. I think I wouldn't underestimate what you know that person would need to be to be successful. Like if you know your customer, if you know your product, at this point you've probably been instrumental to building it, right? But, but I think then the other thing is really rigorously reference check and understand how they've empowered the people around them to achieve those core outcomes. And like whether it's a salesperson or a head of product, talk to people who have worked for that person that they give you and other people that you can get those connections to to really understand how much leverage does that person bring to the game. Because you know the smaller you are, the more leverage you need for each individual hire because you're looking to make a massive incremental jump forward. I, I don't know, do you guys have other ideas? Yeah, so for, uh, this is like before you're hiring. This job, like understanding the role has to be done first time when the thought comes to you, I need somebody to have had the sales. So one of the things that successfully, even my board members portfolio company does, and they advised me and I did it, was meeting people who are in those roles. Mm -hmm. in, in, in tech industry, who are the good VP of sales? I don't need anything from you, but I just want to learn 
about this role for 10, 15 minutes. Uh, if you don't have board or investors yet, that becomes very amazing at some point once you raise money, they are there to help you or calibrate the role with you. And that's a great way. What do salespeople actually mm -hmm. do? What, what do you guys do? How do you measure and understand and then you can yeah. put together a role? And you can even sometimes have those people be on your interview committee if that's you find that. someone who's really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. totally. Ask the right questions, right? Also something I learned in the Alban course, highly recommend always ask the right too. questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so, but also don't underestimate how you actually know what it needs to be, even yeah. though you've never done the job, but you're the That's founder right. of the company. Perfect. All right, All right team. Well, I appreciate you guys. Another round of applause for, for, for the panelists.